One, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven.
one. Hmm. Ah. Well, that's bad. Sorry. Sorry. One, two, three, four, five. I think I've got it now. <laughs> One, two, three, I've got meters. Cool. I've lost my slides now. <laughs> oh, what a day. What a day. What a day, indeed. <laughs> Here I am today. The lecture has now started. I started my recording. I have some slides. You wouldn't believe it. The little wire between my microphone receiver and the audio interface was just a little bit unplugged. And it wasn't so unplugged that I could see it, but it was unplugged enough that I wasn't able to make sounds happen. <laughs> so I was very confused as to why I would be speaking and not see sounds on the meter on my, my audio interface. But I think we've got it now. I'm ready to start the lecture. Welcome to Comp 1720 slash 6720, week seven, part B. Today we're talking, we're continuing our talk about sound and music computing. Really, it's, it's not so much of a, um, uh, you know, code and then artistic lecture. We've done a bit of art stuff in the previous lecture. We'll do a bit more now. Someone's just asked me about assignment three. I'm not gonna say anything more about assignment three today. I will consider requests for some examples, um, but there aren't many. So, um, you know, what it should be like is what you invent. Um, I think you know now the kind of expectations we have for your assignments. Um, the, the task is in some sense secondary to the expectations for an interactive computer-based artwork created in P5. You've done two assignments for me. You've gotten feedback on them. You've got galleries full of all of your peers' assignments. You can go and check out what other people are doing, get lots of inspiration, get lots of great ideas, compare them against your own ideas. Um, and basically, I want you to be creative by yourself. So go ahead and do it. That's assignment three. We're not gonna talk more about assignment three today, except where it relates to sound, which it might, I suppose. Um, sound art, art theory, sound art. So I guess one, one thing we will discuss today is where does sound fit into the art world? Um, into Where does sound fit into this course, art and interaction computing? So one way of framing this question is to, to ask whether sound can be a material in art. So by materials, we've talked about that before, paints, light, computer code, interactions, situations, relationships between people, all of these things can be used as a material in art, some very representational and some very conceptual. What about sound? Well, it has been used as a material in art in the 20th century. Um, there's, there's a whole field of art called sound art. And actually, even though you might think, well, isn't sound art music? Sound art lives as, in some sense, a separate category than music. Um, it's, it, there is a, a split there. They, of course, are related fields. Music is very much related to sound. It's base, based in sound as the material. Um, but sound art is using the same material, the same building blocks as music, but applying an artist, uh, a art world lens to it, maybe a conceptual art lens to it, um, being open to different kinds of experimentation that perhaps are not so open within the music world. Of course, 
musicians often make sound art and sound artists are often musicians. Um, but some, in some sense, the, the traditions are a little bit separate. So there's a little bit of a separation between sound art and music. I guess one way to think of it is that when you go about creating music, you tend to, to take the building blocks of music as your starting point. And that would be notes, pitch, duration, instruments, the standard timbres that we, we hear in instruments we're all familiar with. Whereas when you look at creating a piece of sound art, we're looking maybe at a lower level of raw material in terms of sound. We're looking at what we discussed last lecture, the two raw materials of electronic sound, sound recordings and synthesized sounds. Um, and we're not so much concerned with the, the world of musical instruments, even though those can be used in sound art. Um, we're, we're concerned with perhaps the more generic, general, abstract level of what sound is as a material. So the question is, how can we do this in P5? And I think we've already started to do that a little bit in the previous lecture, looking at how we can use synthesized sounds in P5, how we can create notes in P5, how we can modulate those notes over time, how we can create different, different uh, timbres using the different synthesized uh, waveforms. But today when we do this, we'll be using sound files as the material. And I think that's something which I know you folks have been experimenting with in your assignments. And I, today I want to show you, I hope inspire you in, into a different way of working with sound files that you might not have just, um, thought about before. Because the, the general way, I know this from, from teaching this course, the general way in which Comp 1720 students approach sound is to get a long MP3 file, put it in their sketch. When the sketch starts, it plays back. Or get a sound effect and play it once. And I, I want you to think at a more deep level about what you could do with sound as a material, how you could modify it, parameterize it, apply the computational techniques you've been learning in this course. And I want you to think about how you can use interaction to deeply uh, enhance that experience of hearing those sounds. How can a feedback loop be created between a viewer or a listener and a sketch when using sound in P5? I think you'll have some ideas after today. So we have some slides now which are related to potentially a, a history of sound art in a number of examples. Um, so um, this image, well, I'll just put myself on the other side of the screen so I'm not over her face. This image is of a sound artist called Eliane Radik, a very famous um, sound artist, primarily working in the 20th century. Um, I believe Eliane Radik is still alive. Someone can, can um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'll just check on Wikipedia, that's embarrassing. Um, Yes, Eliane Radig is still alive. Um, there are a number of other um, sound artists of her generation who've recently passed away. They're getting, getting to be in their 90s, um, uh, the folks of, of Eliane Radig's generation. This is, that's a small, uh, um, small digression, but I just want to talk to you for a minute, moment about Eliane Radig's work. Um, this artist worked primarily in sound, but wasn't exactly a musician. She composed sound works, released them on, on albums, did performances, but um, her work wasn't about playing traditional instruments. It wasn't about playing notes. It wasn't about working with orchestras. It was about arranging sounds in time um, and exploring the interaction between listeners and those sounds. Um, Eliane Radig's roots were in um, using recordings to create sound. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about recordings to make sounds, but that was the, the foundations of the field of sound art, sonic arts, was in manipulation of recordings. That was one of the first ways that, that folks in the 20th century started to experience, uh, experiment with how um, electronic sounds can be created and the potential of manipulating electronic sounds was through recordings. But in the 1970s, um, Radig had a kind of shift into her 
second uh, part of her career, working primarily with synthesizers. So we worked with synths um, yesterday, uh, discussed how you could find different sounds and combine them together. Um, and from the 1970s onwards, Eliane Radig's primary work was with, with synths um, and acoustic sounds accompanying them. And one of the things that she's particularly known for is very long compositions. Um, that's a, a, a hallmark of some of the sound art experiences is that they are longer than a typical music experience. If we think about a song in music, it tends to be like three to five minutes long. If we think about a piece of classical music, a symphony, that tends to be about 25 minutes. If we think about a sound artwork, that could be something that lasts for 25 minutes or an hour or days or weeks. These things can be very long um, and they can be designed so that they are performed within a gallery and people come and hear them and they're just playing continually. It's music being created continually, not something which has a beginning, middle and end like a song. Um, so um, I've got a link here. I'm, because I'm streaming to YouTube, it probably doesn't like me too much to, to play a lot of different sounds, but I'm just going to play a little bit of this. Uh, start in the tab, make sure my desktop audio is enabled. I should be getting some sound through when we play some of this. Oh, it was not on YouTube, actually. That's good. It's, um, this is uh, one of Radig's most famous works, the Trilogy of Death, <laughs> I suppose. Three parts. Um, work using the analog ARP synthesizer. Um, I think this is from the late 70s. Let's hear some. I'm just going to skip ahead. This track is one hour in length and the, the, the work here is three of these tracks. A second section just to, to play this back. So Eliane Radig, um, an important 20th century sound artist um, to consider, I um, really encourage you to go and listen to some of her work. Um, there's lots of things on YouTube, you can find it. You can find um, the audio recordings on Bandcamp if you're interested. Um, now this is sort of a rewind because I told you that Eliane Radig's original work was within with audio recordings and there's a, a group here on the screen I'm really mostly interested in talking about this gentleman in the middle called Pierre Schaffer um, who were the pioneers of or some of the pioneers of electronic music and sound art and their primary way of operating was to manipulate audio recordings and these folks were working in, or this, this photo was in the 1970s, but these folks were working right after World War II in, um, in Paris. Um, and they had a, 
a style of music that they started to develop called musique concrète. What does musique concrète mean? Well, they were formulating, Pierre Schaeffer was formulating this idea of music which was created in static form. And that was a new thing. Because if you think before we had audio recordings, the only way to make music or to, to record music was to write down the instructions of how to play it. You would write down the dots on a, spa, on a score for your composition. And a musician can come and pick up that score, that piece of sheet music. They can play the music. It might sound the same. It might sound a little bit different. It's not going to sound exactly the same, but it can always evolve. Different players can interpret things differently. They can teach music to someone else, play something differently. So music was a a changing concept, even though um, we would have something we would consider to be a set composition. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is written down very much set, the notes haven't changed, but people can play it quite differently each time. So when people started to do audio recordings, first of all on wax cylinders, moving on to recordings on discs, like we have our current continual um, tradition of having vinyl records, and then fin finally, in the early 20th century, moving on to recordings on tape, there was a sense in, in capturing a piece of music and making it static, which was never, was unheard of originally. And what these folks were doing, Pierre Schaeffer and the other music concrete originators, they were recording sounds, using them to create a piece of music, a piece of contemporary conceptual music, not using the traditions of, of classical music, not using notes and sounds from the orchestra, using sounds they found all around them through audio recordings, then they would use those sounds, cut up the tapes, assemble a composition using those tapes, re-record different parts of it, play the tapes at different speeds, play them backwards, start and stop in different places, and use that to assemble a composition in time, which was always going to be the same. And no one had ever done that before. No one had ever been able to compose a composition that would directly result in sound. And that was the, the huge innovation of the early electronic music uh, movement after World War II in, in the world. Um, the ability to compose directly to sound not to have this in-between step of giving your composition to musicians and asking them to play it and hoping they do the right thing. Um, because realistically, that's always what happens with composing for musicians. There's always a step of interpretation. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm maybe accidentally going too far into my, my history of electronic music lecture that I sometimes give over at the School of Music, but um, it's an important concept. Why did this happen after World War II? After World War II, during World War II, there were many technological innovations to do with what happens when societies enter a state of total war for, for many years. People already knew about sound recordings on, um, on vinyl, on wax cylinders, and on a kind of tape. But during World War II, the technology for recording um, onto a magnetic tape became much, much better. So after World War II, the technology was all there and folks who worked in radio studios after World War II, an example is Pierre Schaeffer, were able to repurpose that technology into creating music. Of course, the, the idea of a, having a high quality audio tape was originally to be able to record a program for the radio that would then be played back later or played back in a different location. And that was a, a, a technological innovation driven by that requirement for radio broadcasts. Um, in a time of great strife in Europe. Um, here's an example of a composition. This is called Etude de Brie from uh, Pierre Schaeffer. And it's constructed of different types of sounds. I'll just make sure my levels are correct. So I'll take a few seconds of this. Otherwise. Slow in the background. Okay, 1948. 
a long time ago. Something else happening some few years later. Oh, I guess I've the connection between um, Pierre Schaffer and um, Eliane Radig is significant because Eliane Radig originally worked for Pierre Schaffer as a, an assistant in Schaffer's studio before starting her own direction with synthesizers. So now a few years later, John Cage, <laughs> someone knows this piece. Are we talking about the piece on the screen right now, Avery, or, or the ones who, that are, I've just been playing? Um, a few years later, this was a time of great experimentation, the post-war period, post-World War II period in, in music. Um, it was the birth of modernism in music, um, if that's meaningful to you. Modernism was the, the artistic movement that uh, occurred throughout the 20th century. It started earlier in art and architecture and somewhat later in music. Um, one of the most important figures in this movement was a person called John Cage, who was an American musician and composer. Um, and he was part of what's called the New York School now, um, the, a collection of composers and musicians who were doing really wild things in New York City in creating new kinds of music. John Cage wrote many, many kinds of music. I've played a lot of John Cage's music for percussion. Um, one of his very famous pieces is called 4 minutes 33 seconds um, for any instrument or combination of instruments. And the innovation of this piece is that there are no notes in this piece. It is a silent piece of music. And it has multiple movements. You can see, I think it's three movements. You can see them here. They've got a tempo, they have a number of bars, they've got a time signature, but there are no notes to play. Um, and I've got a little section of a performance of 4 minutes 33 in the 70s. With Nordic oh, track, I've got an the ad. results I'm not you. Playing I'll just turn my sound off over here. I'll get back to that in a minute. No ads. I have to get YouTube Premium just to do a performance. I'll skip in. So my question to you is, is this piece silent? Um, is it silent? There's no notes, but there are certainly sounds. And in fact, the idea of John Cage's piece for silence is that the sounds are what happens in, in and around the performer, uh, not just what is created by the performer. So John Cage is sitting there with the piano. He's got a piano out outside creating this environment where people want to come and listen and they're listening to him doing nothing but they're listening to the world around them maybe some of them are, are agitated or or talking to each other so there's um <laughs> yes there is a uh, there's an aspect of using the world around you as a contributor to the sound artwork not just what the composer is doing um here's another piece this is a a very famous piece called Water Walk by, by John Cage, where he is, I'm not going to play the video, I'll just talk to you about it. He has household objects on a stage and he walks around and does things with those household objects that make sounds. And this was a, a really famous piece because, particularly because it was shown on TV in 1960 on US television. Um, there's obviously a much younger John Cage pouring water onto a plant which is in a bathtub. Um, he's sitting in his other hand, he's holding a stopwatch because he has set out a composition of all of the things he's going to do with this artwork as he's walking around the, the stage. All of the actions he takes are very um, intentional composed actions. So he's constructing a performance using everyday sounds, re reinterpreting how um, sounds can be used to create a, a musical work. In some ways it's related to musique concrète, right, because he is using these everyday found sounds, we call them now found sounds, um, but he is doing it in a strictly composed way. The only difference is he hasn't recorded it to the tape. <laughs> 
um, this is maybe going a little bit off, more off piste, but um, this is definitely not in 1951, given the age of, of John Cage in that in that photo. But um, the Cage spent a lot of time considering silence, considering the absence of sound as well as a, a an aspect of sound. Like when we are painting or doing architecture or doing design, we think about space and black and absence of color as materials to use and why not in sound work would we not consider silence as part of our our materials so using anechoic chambers or exploring anechoic chambers to see what he can find in a sound world and i think one of the the anecdotes told about john cage's experience in anechoic chambers sitting in a room like this there is literally no sound around you the sound of the building around is is deadened by the design of the room and there's a very strange sensation of not hearing the reflections of sound off surfaces that you're used to. And he would spend a long time sitting in these chambers and he would not only feel um, somewhat um, disoriented because of the strange experience of being in a chamber with no sound, but also he would start to hear the sounds of his body very loudly. So blood pulsing through your, your head, your, your own breathing, your heart beating, your tummy grumbling. All of these things are sounds that we hear and we hear them through our body, but because there's other sounds around us, we tend to ignore them. But if you sit in an anechoic chamber and have nothing else to listen to, your brain very much focuses on those sounds that it can hear. Um, very interesting experience. Someone said, just said, well, 433 is much like um, um, 433 is equivalent of painting a canvas white. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, someone said now, Cage released another composition where a microphone's pointed at the audience to disprove the theory. No, that's not what this piece is about. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to, to adopt that, but integrate it into my previous theory. Um, you know, I think interpretations of work is not just what the artist intends. And, and Cage could be a bit of a, uh, grumpy character and maybe have fights with people about what things were about. Um, the, a common interpretation of 4 minutes 33 is that the sounds of the world around it are, are important. Um, and I think no matter what Cage says, that's what people hear. You're in a, you're in a hall listening, you hear the sounds of other people. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I guess I respectfully, I take on board that comment that that he disagreed with that, but I also present the, the fact that literally that's what you hear. If you are listening to this, you are hearing things happening. If you're performing it into, into a hall. I know I'm not gonna go deeply into the sound of silence, the whole Cajian theory. I'm not a cage expert. Dr. Alec Hunter over at the School of Music is the New York School expert. He'll surely have much to say on this if you go and take musicology subjects with him. Um, but. I think we can we can all stand to agree that silence can be used as a musical material as well. Um, another instance of integrating sound or lack of sound into a, a art world was this work by Michael Asher at the Pomona College of Art. The idea of this work would be to take a gallery space and make it into an open air chamber. So the, the world outside somehow is, is what's on display here. This gallery space had no features in it. It was just open to the world 24 hours a day and the sounds outside on the street would enter in and that would be what you would hear. So although you're inside that space, you're viewing the world outside and hearing it as well. Something somewhat different is now I suppose we're moving more towards things that are like what you do in, in Comp 1720. Um, this work is called Dream House by Lamont Young and Marianne Zazella. Um, this is a, an installation work which had a life over many years from starting in the 60s to, to quite recent installations. It was installed in different places in New York City. Lamont Young is famous within the world of minimalism and uh, experimental music for very long compositions using very simple sign tones. Um, but the 
the point of these artworks was to project these sounds in a particular space and accompanied by colours and set designs that were set out to enhance the, the, uh, the listener's experience. So if you look at images of these, these um, works being performed, there's a bunch of people lying on the ground, lying for several hours potentially, experiencing this long um, composition within this particular space. Now we're going to do some. We're going to do some stuff. We're going to make some music concrete. We're going to take some sound files as a raw material and create an interactive music work in P5. So I'm just going to make sure my uh, my desktop audio is unmuted. Um. We'll be in a minute. I'll make sure I've lost my, whoa, the many P5JSI, I need the editor. What login? Come on. Don't give me this. I think I've spelled my password wrong. I have to do it twice. Auto fill. We got there. I'm just going to open up my um, template that I saved today. Or not that one actually, that's the template I'll save for later. And just a few more slides just to talk about what we're going to do. So we talked on Monday about how to load a sound file into P5. And I have just reproduced the little snippet of code assigning a p5.soundfile object to a variable. Shimmer equals load sound and then in brackets, you've got the, the address of that sound within your local file system. So you might, if you put it in the assets folder, it will be loading assets slash shimmer.wav if you have a shimmer.wav file there. And we had a chat about three different ways of controlling the playback of this sound. Um, we talked about using dot play to start it. We talked about using dot stop to stop it. And I think I mentioned that you can use dot pause and dot resume to unpause and stop playing this sound file. What we're going to do today is potentially look a bit deeper at these ways of controlling these sound files, um, looking at the different parameters. The dot rate parameter can change the speed and pitch of a sound file, just like making a tape play slower through the tape machine. You can change to a different location in the sound file using dot jump, and you can set it to start and stop looping with dot set loop. So all of these parameters are things we can adjust using our interactive uh, skills with P5. I also want to just mention that there's a lot of parameters in dot play. It's not just <laughs> that's it. You can start at a different time, start sometime in the future, set the rate and the amplitude in that moment. You can set where the tape should start and set how long you want it to play, the duration of that. Um, I just want to point out sometimes, I know folks will have had different experiences with sound in over the last few days as you're doing the, the Lab 7. One thing that happens in browsers is that they don't like tabs to autoplay music. So they won't, won't want YouTube to just start playing if you open it in a second tab. Um, one trick is that or P5 Sound has a built-in trick to help get around this, which would be a function called user start audio. So the idea is that once you've clicked somewhere within the, the window, then the browser is sort of allowed, allows the web page to start playing some sounds. So if you put user start audio inside mouse pressed, that function, that means that if the user clicks their mouse inside the P5 window, then the audio starts up. Some browsers don't need to do this, some do. My advice is if you're using sound in any artwork from now on in this course, put do this, put user start audio inside mouse pressed. If it doesn't need it, it won't do you any harm. If you do need it, then it will make uh, your sketch work properly. I've seen many assignments so far that haven't worked in Safari or Chrome because the, the browsers have just blocked the sound and it's annoying. 
basically it results in me just not listening to it because if I, I would have to open it up in Firefox or go to a different computer or something. And I think <laughs> within our FAQs, we've put some comments to the, to the uh, effect of, we generally don't have time to debug things if it's, if it's not uh, a critical issue. Um, yes, so we're going to do a little bit of sound file composition. I've loaded up some sounds already. Let's sample one, let's sample two, let's sample three, and load, load it up a three samples. Just a note, all of these samples belong to me, I recorded them. Um, and if you want to go and use some sounds in your sketch, go and record some. You can use your phone to, to make audio notes, export them somehow and load them into, um, into your computer and get them into your P5 sketch. You can, within the P5 editor, you can just upload sounds, upload files, add them up here. I've uploaded three different formats of sound. Firefox seems to be okay with playing back all of these formats. Um, MP3s, M4A files, and .wav files. So now I've got my sounds loaded into sound file objects. That's a p5.sound file object. And I've got my canvas created. And this is typically what I've seen so far in the uh, assignment work. In, within setup, someone just does play. It's got the preload loading thing happening there, loading up those sounds. <laughs> Oh, turn that down. We don't want that to be too loud, do we? Sorry, it's not the it's not the fire alarm. So this is this is good. This is working, but it is very boring. And so far, it just plays once and stops. If I want that to play continually, I think I'll have to do set loop. True. And now it will play continually. So far, so good. We've got this sound. Maybe I would like it to, to modify it in time using my mouse location. So how about I use mouse X? Whoops, I change, make this interactive. Right. I'm actually going to set the amplitude to be a little bit smaller, 0 0.8. It's sort of loud in my ears anyway. Um, Sample1.rate, it's going to be based on mouse x divided by width. So we can make a place slower and faster. Is it working? I don't know. Oh, there we go. Well, that's wow. fine, isn't it? Oh. So, there is a really simple way of just manipulating the speed and pitch of this sound file together. But what if I want this to happen um, automatically in some sense? I want the speed the speed of the sound file to continue to change over time. And maybe a good way of doing that is to, or well, thinking back to when we were doing the little Ellipse Olympics. Remember many weeks ago, about week two, I had the little, the little ellipses running across the screen. And I used, to, to accomplish that, I used the uh, frame rate, sorry, the, the frame count, um, variable which is available to me in P5. So maybe within my drawer setup I'm going to make a, a variable called speed and I'm going to make that frame count. I'm not going to use frame count by itself because that's just a number counting upwards, right? I'm going to put a sign function around frame count which will mean that as frame count counts upwards I will get a number between minus one and one. And actually, when, if I set the rate of a sample to one, it will be like full speed playback. 
And if I set the rate of the sample to zero, it'll be stopped. If I set it to minus one, it'll be full speed in reverse. So I might actually I'm going to make that 1.5 times sine frame count. And then I want this to be a bit slower because if I just do sine frame count, it'll be zipping back and forward too quickly. Let's do that divided by 200. And then I will put, set the samples rate according to that. Oops, speed. Let's see how this sounds. Now this is more like the sound of music concrete. It sounds very much like the kind of stuff that Pierre Schaffer was, was playing with. But because we're making an interactive computer artwork, I think we can visualize this as well. So I would like to draw something. Um, I'm just going to make a fill, maybe 240, no stroke. And I'm going to draw an ellipse with that speed. If I just draw the ellipse like this, whoops, maybe speed and 100 in height and it'll make it a 50 by 50 um, ellipse. This is not going to be very interesting because it only moves up to one and a half pixels out. So I might need to change it to speed times width times 0 0.5 plus width times 0 0.5. And now it should be moving way out there. As it moves to the left-hand side of the screen, it's going in reverse. I'll just make this so it doesn't move quite as far out. Maybe give it a bit of motion blur like we did in the um, in the Ellipse Olympics. There we go, there's that motion blur. Ooh. Now one other thing, another piece of information about what we're doing that it might be useful to look at would be the location of our sound files playback in, within that sound file. So I might actually map that to the Y dimension of my ellipse. And I can create another variable, let um, location equal, it's going to be samp1 dot, oh, what is it? Current something. Did I write it down? I didn't. I have to look it up in the reference. Looking it up in the reference, that's how we work. Sound file. Uh, so next to duration, current time. Current something, I knew. Current time. And the current time will give you the number of seconds through your, perform your sound files progression. So we'll divide that by samp one dot duration which is the total number of seconds in the sound file. And now I've got a number between zero and one. And I'm just gonna multiply that by height here. To get my ellipse location. So now I've got my moving blob. As it goes down the screen, that means I'm scrolling through the sound file. Which is kind of cool, isn't it? Now, I want to make this interactive, so maybe every time I, I hit a, the mouse, we might actually change where we are in the sound file, no matter where we st have started. So I'm going to put in here, samp one dot jump, and that will mean that I jump to a different location. And it's going to be to do the duration thing again, random, zero, samp one, dot, duration. So a random number of seconds inside that sound file whenever I click the mouse. And so my Y should change when I do that as well. Yeah. 
You can see because I set looping on this sound file, it goes off the top of the screen and comes back to the other side. Well, this is a good sort of first layer. I might just turn that down a little bit more. 0 0.6. I go back to my, my slides, and I have a few more slides to give today. Sorry, I'm going to run a little bit over because I had that technical hiccup right at the start. Um, but I want to talk about using sound files to form a note. So on Monday we talked about using the envelope, to the ADSR envelope, to shape a sound over time, to, to have a short attack phase and then um, taper that sound's amplitude off through time um, to create a note with a synthesized sound. But we can do that to sound files as well, in fact. So I'm just going to make, I've got the instructions of how to do it here. I'll just copy this in. I'll have to adjust it. So I've got, I need to let n make a new envelope, declare the variable. I'm going to do this with sample 2 actually, which is my little synthesized squeaky sound. Samp 2's amplitude is going to start at zero. Its loop is going to be true. And I'm just going to start playing it so that it's always playing. And then for the envelope, we're going to set its input to be sample 2's output. I might, if I may, put the trigger for the envelope down here. So if I, whenever I run this m.play, it will play a short note. It's just using the default settings at the moment. You can change the settings with the parameters of play and the parameters of envelope if you want. So every time I hit that, you should hear a little squeaky squeak sound from my little synthesizer that I recorded. Maybe it would be nice to, whenever I play that, my sample synthesizer sample will always also have a random rate, random pitch and speed, just random between minus one and one. Actually, minus zero point five is all a bit squeaky. I want it to be lower. And I want it to be a bit louder too. So now we're getting something that's quite music concrete. I think I might need another ellipse just to track that that um, sample sound again. when those, those envelopes um, turn off. Do I have to put a number in here, maybe? Oh, I forgot how to do envelopes already. I already knew. Reference.
It never goes away. I want my play to stop. <laughs> How did I make them stop? I can't even remember. Play envelope. to get it to work. Oh, I see, because I set the amp 1.2 there. I shouldn't have done that. That was my problem all along. Just a, a silly rookie error. Anyway, I think... I think unless there are any uh, requests for how to do this, I might leave my little piece of, of music concrete there. Um, save this one as my demo for today. Oh. Save it. I will add this to my collection. You'll be able to see it within what I've done this year. I've got a few, the ones from Electron Monday to add to my collection as well. But I just wanted to demonstrate a way of doing sound with P5 that wasn't just about playing back a sound file once. This is about composing with sound, creating an interaction that people can start to explore and use sound in an unexpected way. So I'll just go through a few more slides I've got for you. Um, you can also use recording with P5. There's an object called audio in. If you want to record a sound file object with audio in, you also have to use the sound recorder object. So the audio in just connects the microphone to something and then the sound recorder mm, turns that into a sound file object. And I've got a short snippet about how to do this below. You set the input of the recorder to be your sound input object. Then you create a new sound file recorder.record to the sound file, and then when you're done recording, you stop. I have to say, be very careful with this technique. Um, if you accidentally connect your audio in to the output, by default it's not connected, um, you'll get a lot of feedback. If someone has an open microphone and speakers on their computer, they're typically right next to each other, so connecting those two things would be bad. It would be very annoying. Your audio in might be unpredictable, so I don't want to use it in my lecture because I'm already using my microphone to, to stream. So if I did have to use my audio input, I would be wanting to use a different microphone. But look, it's, it's something which is a bit unpredictable um, and it can be very annoying if it's not done very well. So do be careful if you want to use audio in. A little bit of advice, your job when you're using audio is to manage the sonic experience for your user. I will not be impressed if I see sonic experiences that are really just playing a sound file once in the setup uh, function and then leaving it at that. You need to do more work, just like you need to do more work to make sure that your, the rest of your sketch is dynamic and engaging and interactive. Make sure your sounds are dynamic, interacting and engaging if you use them. Um, make sure you're using sound files that are interesting Please record files if you want to use them. If you want to get some sound effects, make ones. Make them from things you found in your room, like kitchen implements, um, clicking spoons together, hitting the bottom of a bottle, um, tapping the keys on your keyboard. There are all kinds of sounds you can create just in front of you right now that you can use to sample and create sounds out of. Don't just download things from the internet, please. Generate your own sounds with the synths. Um, this is this is. If I can tell you one thing about how to use sounds, it's to use unique, novel, and interesting sounds, not just this uh, level of, of internet downloading. Um, there's some, some more links here which you can explore on your own about classic sound artworks. Brian Eno's Music for Airports kind of takes that music concrete tradition of using tape as a compositional work and turns it into something which is then musical. He released these as ambient tapes and founded the genre of ambient music, which takes its cue from sound art. Again, I just want to mention my, my work. I'll put my hand up as an example of a recent interactive artwork that includes sound. I'll just play a little bit of this video. Um, I won't worry about content um, to text for this one because it belongs to me. Oop, it's not going to play. I'll come back to it. No, let it, let it load and then we can play it. Okay. 
So you can see whenever we move, different, different sound files are being played at different rates. It's similar to what I was just doing now in this particular scene. there's different continuous loops that are being changed as we move our hands across the screen. And there's no reason you couldn't do something similar to this, similar kinds of interactions in P5. In fact, I wish I had P5 when we had this. I had to do it in a much more annoying way. Some more modern, if you're interested, this is perhaps the, the kind of sound works I work on these days. This piece uses um, a machine learning system that I created that reproduces gestures on musical instruments using neural networks. Um, it's sort of a, a, I guess in the genre of noise, um, and ambient sounds, but I'll just skip forward ahead to where you can see what I'm doing in this work. Lamont Young inspired using these sign tones as a, a material, but then getting to a more noisy place a bit further in the piece. And finally, I just wanted to, to mention that within the world of sound art, there was a, a period of time when people really moved towards computers um, or desktop computers and laptops as the way to create sound. But people in some sense have gone back to using complicated hardware adapted from the, the world of, of radio and tape recorders as their material. So they create their own instruments from individual synthesizer modules, synthesizers, processors, and program them not just using code, but using cables to connect the different parts of their synthesizers together. So this artist, Elaine Vogelsinger, um, you can watch, she released a great album this year. Um, you can watch a great video of her performing in an abandoned house, which is amazing. Um, but watching her play, make great music with these modular synthesis systems. Many of the synthesizers that, that are in front of this artist are computers. They've got very small computers inside them, simple computers. Um, but they allow a different kind of interface to, to interact with them. So I think the, the sound art world is kind of moves back and forward between different technologies and we're definitely in a, a phase at the moment of really interesting innovation within the space of patchable hardware, connectable elements that you connect with physical cables. Remembering just a few things, do's and don'ts of sound. Please do use sound in your work. Please don't just play back MP3s from the internet. I won't be impressed if I hear that. Do think about enhancing the experience, creating something which is really interactive and in, in, um, connects well with what your, your, your artwork is designed to do. But please, please, please don't annoy the user. 
or don't do things which are going to be frustrating as an experience. So if you do use sound, make sure you test it. Talk to your friends, send them your work. Let them give you feedback. If they say it didn't work, take that on board. Make sure you're doing all the things you can to make that sound work on different browsers and in different environments. We have some further reading and watching. You can check out different, different uh, works from Shafer, um, Cardiff, Eliane Radig, and others. And with that, it is the end of week seven sound. Um, thanks for sticking with me. If anyone is still there watching live, welcome to those who are, <laughs> have been watching this after the fact. Um, if there's any questions, please leave them on the forum or in the chat. Um, we'll be really, I'm really looking forward to seeing what folks do with sounds. This week you get a bit more of a primer within your lab, um, but I think that there's a lot to be learned still. There's a lot to be learned even outside of what I've pre presented here. I could teach, and I, in fact I do teach a whole course on um, computer music at the ANU, and that would be, ooh, one example would be, um, if you want to go further in this, and you laptop ensemble. This is a course, I think it's running under comp 2710 or comp 3710. Um, oh, that's the wrong, wrong website. Here we go. This is a ANU computer science course in creating computer music works in an ensemble situation. It's a studio based course. Um, you generally work with a, a bunch of like-minded folks. Um, I'm seeing someone in the chat talking about uh, VCV Rack, a free emulation of modular system. I really encourage folks, if you're interested in modular, go get VCV Rack. You can do a lot of interesting modular experiments with VCV Rack without paying any money. Modular synthesizers are expensive. They're extremely expensive um, because they're being created by folks in the community and the, it, it's extremely expensive to produce hardware without the backing of a big company. Um, and they are, it's a big investment if you wanna really get into modular synthesizers. There's other synthesizers you can get into which aren't as challenging to, to afford. Um, but you know, Thomas, come take my course, come do Lens. Uh, if you wanna play with VCV Rack, learn how to code in PD and Extempore and do uh, computer music the computer science way. This is running in se um, semester two next year, will be the next time it runs. And with that, I think I will say goodbye. So thank you for joining me. Any more questions, I will catch up with you later.